It is Jack's 200 weekend, with the River City celebrating 200 years since its birth. We're talking to the local historian and considering the highs and lows of the past two centuries, like toll roads and terrible smells. Part of our show will also look at the unique style of government. Chris Hand helps us understand the consolidated city and county on This Week in Jacksonville. So glad you're with us today. Yeah, the River City officially turns 200 this coming Wednesday, June 15th. City of Jacksonville commemorated the milestone this weekend. Much of that took place in downtown with a large bicentennial program at James Weldon Johnson Park. Joining us right now, Dr. Alan Bliss from the Jacksonville Historical Society. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, and, and I think as we've been ramping up to, hey, this is the 200th year of Jacksonville, there's been a lot of interest in, hey, what is our history? Where did we come from? So why don't you take Take us down that path and get us started here. Uh, how did we go from being Cal Ford to Jacksonville some 200 years ago? So thanks, Kent. And uh, it was June 15th, 1822, when a group of local residents, uh, somewhere more than 60 local residents, signed a petition to the then U.S. Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, asking him to designate the place that they called Jacksonville in the Florida Territory as a customs port of entry. And uh, there's no evidence that Secretary of State Adams ever responded to that. I'd love it if we could find his letter, uh, either even just acknowledging that he had received the request. We can only speculate he didn't act on it. There was no, uh, there was no designation. Uh, my own favorite speculation is that he read the petition, read the letter, uh, called for a map of the new Florida Territory to be brought in, studied it under a magnifying glass, couldn't find any place called Jacksonville and maybe thought to himself, I'm not sure they're ready for this quite yet. Yeah. And, but it's worth remembering that Florida was at that point practically brand new as a part of the United States until the year before it had been part of Spain. It was ceded to the United States through the uh, adams onise Treaty uh, the year before. It officially became a U.S. territory and it remained a territory until 1845. But when you think about the people of this area in June of 1822, appealing to the federal government to identify their little settlement, which had up until then been known colloquially as Calford, as you said, uh, they probably thought to themselves, it would be good if we can somehow associate ourselves with some American patriotic figure. Yeah. And in 1822, it would have been hard to find anybody who was more heroic in the American popular imagination than Andrew Jackson. He had not yet become president. That was several years in the future at that point. But he was a, a authentic military hero. He had uh, distinguished himself at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. Forces that he led had defeated the British Army. And uh, he really, he was a patriot, a hero, and of a strong voice for American independence and the virtues of this free society. So you're, you're kind of answering that next question I would have had it. Why that name? Well, because appealing to an Andrew Jackson, this, this kind of national hero or what have you. Uh, I want to show some of the kind of the oldest images that we have of Jacksonville. And uh, it doesn't go back to 1822 that I can imagine. This is, uh, I think we've only got a couple of pictures here, but they show a shot of Union occupation and then an 1860 shot of Bay Street. So what was Jacksonville like back then, 19th century? You can see from the images that it was a rather dusty looking small town, <laughs> and, but by 1860, it was considerably bigger uh, than it had been in 1822. There was, it was a truly dusty, hot, humid little hamlet uh, nestled on the north bank of the St. Johns River uh, when the petition was established. The image that you just showed your audience shows Bay Street. And it's interesting to notice that the riverbank at that point still came all the way up to Bay Street. If you go back to that same location now, the riverbank is several hundred feet over your shoulder down along uh, Water Street. And the river is quite a bit narrower at that stretch of the, of the St. John's than it would have been in the 1820s, in the 1860s, really up until the turn of the 20th century. The river has become narrower. We have filled it in. And mm -hmm. during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, lots of docks and wharves and railroad sidings were built along that stretch mm -hmm. where we just saw housing and, uh, and some uh, 
some wooden buildings. Changed some contour a little bit, it sounds like. Changed the contour. It changed the uh, hydrogeology of the St. John's River. It resulted in much faster river current flows moving through the downtown area. How come? Because the river is a lot narrower and you know what happens to water. Yeah. Well, it's flowing through there, that's for sure. Uh, I want to show one more image here. Uh, there's a defining line in my mind in Jacksonville history, and that would be the Great Fire. So I want to show you some photos, 1889-ish to 1900. These are pictures, some troops marching through downtown at the start of the Spanish-American War. Uh, what, what was Jacksonville like before that fire? And we're going to talk a little bit later about what happened after the fire in 1901. Jacksonville, at the time of the Great Fire, was... Florida's most important city. It was then, really? continues to be uh, really the center of business and commerce and, uh, and culture in the state of Florida. There maybe have been some quibbles from the people of Key West that fancy that city as particularly important, and it was in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But at the time of the Great Fire, Jacksonville loomed large, and it did in the later years of the 20th century as well. But remember the photo we saw a few minutes ago of those wooden buildings along Bay Street? Yeah. That characterized construction in Jacksonville throughout the 19th century. How come? Because Jacksonville at that time, and still does, occupy a space amidst the pine flatlands, pine, pine flat woods of northeast Florida and southeast Georgia. The most accessible building material was right timber, in front of it. Yeah, right in front of us. So that made it easy, logical, economically uh, accessible to build from wood, and that was exactly the same condition that made the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871 burn so cheerfully as a result of the incident that started that. Is that what we saw at the Great Fire in 1901? Exactly right. This was principally a town uh, with a lot of wood construction. There were masonry buildings, but the intensity of the Great Fire was so great that it robbed those masonry buildings of their structural integrity and even brick buildings such as churches, the old city hall, collapsed. And one of the only artifacts that remained was the uh, granite column in what's now James Weldon Johnson Park that held aloft a statue of a Confederate soldier. Uh, that column that still remained. St it remains. The okay. column is still there, even though the statue is no longer there. But what happened after the fire, I think, is just as important as the fire and itself. And these are some of the photos, and we'll wrap up for a moment after this, but these are some of the photos after the fire. And so a renovation, really, in Jacksonville, right? Exactly right. Uh, by burning out the downtown core, the fire created a blank canvas for creative, smart, relatively young, innovative architects from places up north such as Chicago and New York to come to Jacksonville hoping to make a new career for themselves, and indeed they did. It was a place where they not just deployed their design talents, but also the new emerging construction technologies of the period, steel reinforced construction, electronic elevators, uh, telecommunications, the early telephone. All of these things really account for the downtown that we inherited, which really emerged in the roughly 10 to 15 years after the Great Fire. All right, so Dr. Bliss, not going very far, gonna be back in just a moment. First though, uh, a little bit of a detour. We are diving into consolidation, what it is, why it happened in Jacksonville. That's next on our show, so stay with us on This Week in Jacksonville. Get the Planet Fitness Black Card, our most popular membership with 2,000 plus locations. Bring a friend every time you visit. I love friends. And relaxing massage chairs. Mm. Feel fit-tacular with the PF Black Card for zero enrollment, $24.99 a month. Deal ends June 15th. With less moderate to severe eczema, why hide your skin if you can help heal your skin from within? Hide my skin? Not me. Dupixin helps keep you one step ahead of eczema with clearer skin and less itch. Don't use if you're allergic to Dupixin. Serious allergic reactions can occur that can be severe. Tell your doctor about new or worsening eye problems such as eye pain or vision changes, including blurred vision, joint aches and pain, or a parasitic infection. Don't change or stop asthma medicines without talking to your doctor. Ask your doctor about Dupixin. Being injured in an accident is only the beginning of your problems. Don't throw away your one shot at compensation. Make it count. Fair and fair. You can get your smile back today. At Affordable Dentures and Implants, we make high quality tooth replacement affordable for everyone. So whether it's a single tooth, full dentures, or life-changing dental implants, 
we have an experienced dentist who can help you go ahead and smile. Click or call to schedule your new smile consultation today. Go ahead and smile. Get 1.9% APR for 36 months on a new 2022 Toyota RAV4. Toyota, let's go places. Unlock exclusive news stories. Become a News 4 Jax Insider. Sign up and sign in. Free is our favorite word. Like free samples. Yum. Joy. Thank you. At Morgan & Morgan, our fee is free. You don't pay anything unless we win your case. Free samples. Injured? Call Morgan & Morgan. Forthepeople.com. Get the Planet Fitness Black Card, our most popular membership with 2,000 plus locations. Bring a friend every time you visit. I love friends. And relaxing massage chairs. Mm. Feel fit-tacular with the PF Black Card for zero enrollment, $24.99 a month. Deal ends June 15th. When it comes to keeping you informed, the sky is the limit. A live look from our tower camp. News for Jax, empowering you with a county by county network of 15 aerial cameras showing you this traffic in both directions so you can avoid seeing this built for the elements so you can see threats from miles away a window to the world on all your screens the news for jack skycam network you're watching this week in jacksonville with kent justice this weekend has been about celebrating Jacksonville's bicentennial. On News for Jacks, we've looked at several of the historical moments for the River City. And I sat down with government law attorney and author Chris Hand to talk about consolidation. It's almost 55 years since voters decided to radically reform city government in Duval County. What happened in the late 1960s because a series of challenges that the community was having in the mid-1960s, local leaders decided that something needed to change, there needed to be a reform in government. That reform was taking what had been the city of Jacksonville and what had been the separate Duval County government and merging them into a single consolidated government. So if you live in Jacksonville, anywhere you live in Duval County, uh, you're part of the city of Jacksonville because it is both the city and the county government. Why did that happen? We talked about there were some challenges going on there, but, but hey, challenges will be solved by. That was the idea. How does this solve some of those challenges from the 1960s? Well, you have to go back, Kent, and remember what was happening during that period of time. Very difficult period in Jacksonville's history. The school system had been discredited. There had been multiple election, elected officials who were indicted on corruption issues. The St. John's River was seen as, you know, very concerningly polluted uh, during that period of time. Local government was seen as bureaucratic. Uh, you know, there were not only, for example, there was a Jacksonville City Council, but there separately, uh, there were city commissioners as well as a county commission. Uh, and there were a variety of budget issues as well. So there was just this confluence of a number of challenges. And that sort of generated a real spirit of reform in government and a desire to make government more efficient and more effective. And the way they decided to do that was to put it to the voters to see how they felt about merging the city and county government. And overwhelmingly, on August 8th, 1967, the voters chose to create the consolidated city of Jacksonville. Because we get to look back and do a little analysis. Did it solve the problems that were there? And has it lived up to the billing of those voters those many years ago who said, yes, this is for Jacksonville? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I think it created a more efficient governmental structure. Kent, if you go to other places in Florida, for example, both Miami-Dade County and Broward County each have more than 30 different municipalities in those counties in addition to their county governments. Well, here in Jacksonville, the buck stops in one place, at the city of Jacksonville. There's a single government, both city and county. If one wants to do business with local government in Jacksonville, it's very clear where that has to happen. So from an efficiency and an accountability standpoint, I think in many ways, yes, that promise has been fulfilled. But in other ways, it has not. As part of that consolidation campaign that took place 55 years ago this year in 1967, 
promises were made to many Jacksonville neighborhoods uh, saying that, look, if consolidation passes, you might lose some political power and some political influence, but you're going to gain better infrastructure, paved streets. We're going to replace uh, septic tanks and put you on city water, deal with other issues like that. And for many of those neighborhoods over the last 55 years, those promises that were made in 1967 haven't been fulfilled over that period. So there is still promise yet to be fulfilled to make sure that the benefits of consolidation reach everybody in this entire community. And too many people in that situation are saying this has taken too long, but there has been progress even in the last couple of years to try and fulfill some of those promises you just discussed. There has been progress over time and in fact in the most recent uh, in recent legislation passed by city council to enhance the local option gas tax. Some of that money is going to replace septic tanks in parts of Jacksonville. But what there hasn't been, Kent, is a sustained effort over time to fulfill those promises once and for all. So as we get ready to start the next potentially 55 years of consolidation, one really important issue to decide what consolidation is going to look like in the future is do we extend the benefits of consolidation to the entire community? Do we fulfill the promises that were made in 1967 for everybody so that everyone can have those benefits going forward? Do you see it ever changing that the city would say, nope, we don't like this consolidation model anymore, uh, every town for himself? Well, I think it's really helpful to always have discussion about that, Ken. Anytime that a, a community says, well, this is absolutely the way we should do it and we should never consider anything else, I think is when they start running into challenges. So I think people always need to be open-minded about options. What I think this anniversary is a great opportunity to do is assess what's worked with consolidation, what hasn't worked, and how do we mend it? Um, so that we don't ultimately have to end it because it has had those benefits of efficiency, accountability. It's helped the community do large things. For example, we probably wouldn't have had the Jacksonville Jaguars here today without consolidated government and the ability to marshal the entire community behind an important goal. But it is very important at these anniversary dates to take a very kind of close look and decide what's working, what's not working, how can this be made even better for the entire community? And this 55th anniversary of the consolidation vote, and of course the 200th anniversary of Jacksonville is a perfect opportunity to say, what's working well, what's not working well, how do we make it better for everybody? What does it mean to you that we are celebrating this 200 years that Jacksonville has been a known entity in Florida and throughout the nation? Well, I think it's occasions like these are always special because it gives you a chance both to look back and see where the community has been, uh, how it's evolved, how it's progressed. But I think anniversaries like this are also special because they're an opportunity to look forward. That if you reach an anniversary date and you're simply looking at the past, uh, maybe not taking advantage of the full opportunity to say, this is where we've been, that this is where we could be going. And that's certainly what I hope will happen at this 200th anniversary of the entire community. Take a look back at the past, see where we've been, how have we succeeded, how have we failed, what mistakes have been made, and do we need to maybe correct in the future? But then turn the focus to the next 200 years for Jacksonville. What do we want this community to look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 200 years from now? What do we want it to look like and what is it going to take to get there so that every person who lives in this community has the opportunity for success, has the opportunity to be part of Jacksonville and part of the success of Jacksonville as we go toward future anniversaries. The Historical Society's Alan Bliss is back with us in just a moment. We're going to look at the most recent 100 years next on This Week in Jacksonville. Stay with us. Each week, Channel 4 recognizes the Snyder All-Star Athlete. If you'd like to nominate a student for recognition during the next school year, go to news4jax.com and look for All-Star Athlete under the Sports tab. Listening to a client gives that client the respect that they deserve. It gives them comfort to know that there's somebody there looking after them. Another crazy day? Of course. You're a CIO in 2022, but you're ready because you've got the next generation in global secure networking from Comcast Business with fully integrated security solutions all in one place. So you're covered on-premise and in the cloud. You can run things the way you want. Your team, ours, or a mix of both. 
with the nation's largest IP network from the most innovative company. Bring on today with Comcast Business, powering possibilities. With every generation, the Subaru Forester has been a leader in crash safety. Working to undo the impact a crash can have on your life. Which has led the Forester to even be able to detect danger and stop itself. The Subaru Forester has earned the IIHS Top Safety Pick Plus eight times. More than Honda CRV or Toyota RAV4. Love. It's what makes Subaru Subaru. Jason Fisher is a conservative fighter with the record to prove it. Liberals tried to take away our gun rights and take over our streets, but Fisher said no to gun control and defunding the police. He stood with Governor DeSantis to ban sanctuary cities and keep critical race theory out of the classrooms. And as a member of the Electoral College, Jason Fisher fought back against those trying to steal the election from President Trump. Tested, trusted, conservative. We need Jason Fisher in Congress. Florida Trust is responsible for the content of this advertising. the best when you have fresh groceries at great prices delivered to your door. Kroger's Delivery Pros guarantee your food is handled with care and our refrigerated trucks make sure every order gets to you extra fresh. Start your cart now. Kroger, fresh for everyone. At Take 5, you stay in your car because we're faster than you think. Oil change is done. Gosh, I don't even have time to stretch my legs. Guess you have to do it at home. Guess I'll have to do it at home. Take five to stay in your car, 10 minute oil change. Exact Track 4D, cutting edge technology to keep you safe. Snyder Man here, reminding you to be cool this summer. Protect yourself from the sun, drink plenty of water, and. Our AC is out! Have us inspect your unit before it's too late. Learn more about our service plans at SnyderAC.com. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. Thanks for staying with us this morning. Dr. Alan Bliss leads the Jacksonville Historical Society. He is a CEO, executive director. So we've spoken about the life of the city up through the Great Fire in 1901 and then kind of directly after that. What about the most recent hundred years? What stands out to you in Jacksonville's history? Oh, man, Jacksonville has had the most interesting history, I think, of any place in Florida. And uh, I say that with, with due respect to our uh, ancient neighbors to the north and south. Uh, but during the years of the Great War, about 15 years after the Great Fire, Jacksonville became an industrial city. Uh, the largest employer in Jacksonville were the industrial, uh, the industrial firms that built ships, merchant ships and warships for the United States Navy and also for transatlantic commerce. That was in response to the demands for uh, convoy shipping and lots of vessels to r support the U.S. involvement in the Great War. One of the results was a boom in population as lots of people moved into Jacksonville from the surrounding regions of Northeast Florida and Southeast Georgia to take jobs in the new shipbuilding firms that were established on both banks of the river. Those people moved to Jacksonville within a very short period of time and most of them seem to have stayed. <laughs> and that accounts for a sudden and rapid growth in Jacksonville's population annexation of surrounding communities picked up in the decade of the 1920s and into the 1930s. Jacksonville grew rapidly in the early years of the decade of the 1920s. This is, two, this is 2022, but this year we will, in addition to the city's bicentennial, be celebrating the centennial anniversary of numerous civic clubs, churches, neighborhood associations and businesses that established themselves uh, early in the 1920s, many in the year of 1922. Wow. Um, the city grew so fast, in part also because of automobilization. The introduction of cars was something that had not been thought of very seriously in the first decade after the Great Fire, but by the end of the Great War, automobile registrations in Florida and especially in Duval County picked up rapidly. Yeah. That made road building newly urgent and traffic congestion and housing shortages and real estate development took off. And so we saw the development of new neighborhoods such as San Jose, Venetia, the Ortega area on both banks of the river moving south from the old downtown core 
and the area around the riverbank. The first automotive bridge to cross the St. Johns River was Which called one was the, that? It was called the St. Johns River Bridge, <laughs> subsequently named the Acosta Bridge. The Acosta, how about that? That was in 1921. So uh, we're, before we run out of time, I want to fast forward to the 1980s. I told you I'd mention this. I'm looking at some of our archive video. The 1980s, I mean, it, some people would give the headline PU because of this rotten egg smell that was there. That changed Tommy Hazuri, the late mayor of Jacksonville, uh, back in 1987. Also, uh, toll Roads were a thing back in the 80s as well, and we've talked about some tolls were coming back and the outer belt and what have you, but this was a big issue. All of these things we've been talking about throughout the week as we looked at what's happened in these last 200 years. I wanted to leave the last minute or so, Alan Bliss, that we could talk about what about the future. I know you just mentioned it. Historians look the other direction. What if you look forward for Jacksonville? The whole value proposition of history is to get context about the current, the present moment. And so it's true that historians and anniversary moments are for considering the past, and we look back at 200 years of Jacksonville, but the value of doing that is to remind us that we occupy a place and we stand on the shoulders of generations upon generations of people who occupied the city before us, we inherit the legacy of their decisions, their choices, the places that they built. We didn't design the city, others did. We didn't build many of the buildings, others did. But we are the, studio, the, we are the stewards and custodians of those places now. And when you think about Jacksonville's legacy that way, it animates us to greater citizenship in the present. How come? Because it reminds us that the generations who come after us will be standing on our shoulders they will inherit the legacy of the decisions that we've made and the places that we leave for them. It strengthens our citizenship as people of Jacksonville. It reminds us that as complicated as this city is, we have a duty to try to leave it better than we found it. Yeah. Alan Bliss, I appreciate your uh, insights today and talking through all of that. Now, we put together a one-hour special on the 200th birthday of Jacksonville called The Bold City Bicentennial. You can stream it on demand right now on News 4 Jax Plus. So thanks again for being with us today. Among our guests next time, two scholars from the 5,000 Role Models program in Duval County Schools. Young people doing the right things and succeeding. It's awesome. You're going to get to hear from a couple of them next week. This Week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17 and then online at newsforjax.com or streaming on News 4 Jax+. Plus. Every day, more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.